It's good to be in church today. Good to worship the Lord. Amen? Uh, if you're like me, good night, Almighty. You're, uh, you know, busy during these days. These are busy days. And uh, if you're like me, you need to be in church. And you need to be in church on days like today with the family to, number one, recognize what it is all about. It is all about Jesus. I need to be reminded of that. I'm the pastor, and I need to be reminded of that every single day. I can promise you, you need to be reminded of that. It's one of the reasons we need each other. It's one of the reasons we need the church. Amen? I read some time ago that um, if you take kids who have 4.0s, and you, uh, they, they did a survey years ago, and they discovered that of all of the children who have 4.0s, great average, that they have a couple of things in common, but the thing that was on the top of the list, listen to this, was they ate as a family together at least three times a week. Now, there were other things that were in common, but that was the one thing that stood out, that they gathered around a table with a family, and they ate together. Now, if you're like me, you think, my goodness, food's important. But you dig a little deeper, and you understand it's much deeper than the food. It's about relationships. It's about communication. It's about talking. I also read not long ago that the average parent spends 2.7 seconds a day talking to their children. 2.7 seconds. I try to get that out of the way early in the morning. Amen? <laughs> There's something about us being together, yes or no. There's just something about the family. And I need you to really lean in close and listen to what I want to share with you today. Because if you're not careful, there, there's even the desire and the inclination to just sort of slip into church, slip out. Preacher, I'll come in late, I'll leave early. No one will see me, no one will ask me my name. I'll never turn in a guest card because I'm afraid there are some ninjas that will come to my door at 2 in the morning and will invade my home. And I don't want that to happen. I don't want anyone to know who I am. I want to remain anonymous. Just want to slip in, slip out. Don't want to shake anyone's hand. Don't want to speak to anyone. Don't want to talk to anyone. And I want everyone in the room to hear me very carefully. Nothing could be further from New Testament Christianity than that. Nothing. You're not doing God any favors to just sort of slip into church and slip out, not allow anyone to see you, not talk to anyone, to say, I don't want anyone to bother me. You, you, you fall for the line if you're not careful. I can worship God as good at home. I can worship God as good at work. I can worship God as good in a deer stand or wherever I may be on the road. But I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, hear me very well. We've got to have relationships. We've got to have connections. Amen? And uh, what we're going to talk about today as we partake of the Lord's Supper is that family truth and the truth of the Lord's Supper that brings us together in what I am convinced is perhaps the highest expression of worship that any of us can ever experience. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians with me in your Bibles, and let's go to chapter 11. We have participated in the Lord's Supper several times this year. It's the first time, though, that I've been able to preach on it, and I just feel that we need to take a little time, slow down, and talk about the meaning and significance again of why we do this. It's not just a tagline. It's not just something that we add on. It is something crucial. It is something pivotal. It is something really important. It is an ultimate expression of worship. It is a family truth. It is us as the family of God, the family of faith, pledging our love to the Lord and to one another. It is sitting together around the Lord's table. Can you imagine pulling up a chair at the Lord's table? That's what we're about to do. And we're participating with the Lord and with one another in his supper, in the Lord's Supper. It is marvelous. It's amazing. It's incredible. Uh, what I would not give for just another dinner with my dad, for another opportunity to sit down and to hear those cheesy stories. Can I get a witness? Amen? And uh, to watch him uh, eat banana pudding and then give himself an insulin shot. Who knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> I would often say, Dad, that's not how this works, but it worked for him. Amen. <laughs> and so today as the church, we get to gather together around the Lord's table, and we as a family 
a family. Understand your role. We used to sing years ago, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I modified it a little bit. I'm surprised you're a part of the family of God. Nevertheless, <laughs> and we really should be, yes or no. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. Now, in given these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better but for the worst. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. There must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. One is hungry, another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. This is why you're doing it. You're remembering me, he said. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whosoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would only judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Hey, folks, they're, 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 we could preach an hour on that. I don't like the chastening of the Lord, but I'd much prefer to be chastened by the Lord than condemned with the world. Amen? Just quick, I'll get back to it. But, you know, I, I saw someone wear a shirt the other day. It said, only God can judge me. Hey, I've got a newsflash for you, and he will. We'd probably much prefer a bunch of sorry Baptists judging us than God. Amen. And, and what's, what, what's interesting, when we make those statements, only God can judge me, it is in some ways with a condescending look as if to say, you can't judge me. But see, you don't understand the point of the church. If that's your mentality, you don't understand the part of the family. Uh, believe it or not, I have a family that calls me out. You pray for the Holy Spirit to get me. Julie gets me most of the time before the Holy Spirit. And I don't mean that irreverent. Amen? I mean, she will whoo, call it out. And then I've got my mini-me that likes to call me out. And now a new daughter. What a blessing. <laughs> Who likes to call me out? And before Jesus, please hear me. I need it. I may not like it, but I need it. And I really, really, if I only had enough sense, would beg God for it. Amen? Who's listening? And so the Bible says, watch this, when we're chastened, when we're judged by the Lord, it's in order that we're not condemned with the world. We'd much prefer to be called out and dealt with before it's exposed for the world to see. Verse 33, therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And then Paul says, and the rest I'm going to set in order when I come. The church, God's church, God's people, and God has specifically designed his church. I read a statement. This is not an exact quote, but it went something like this. Yes, the church of God has many flaws, but woe to the individual who loves to point them out. I think that's a good statement. The church of God does have many flaws because we're people, yes or no. We cannot say it enough. Christianity is not Christians. Christianity is Jesus. And we are the bride and we are the church. And every one of us in the room, all of us together, collectively in the room and individually, have clay feet. We have a sinful nature. And we're wicked individuals. 
And we need to be very, very careful, watch this, in marveling over pointing out the flaws of God's church. It is God's church. It was his idea. It was on his heart. He created it. He planned it. He nurtured it. He loves it. And one of the reasons God puts us together in a church, watch this, is so that each of us have appropriate accountability. We look good when we're by ourselves. But when we're around other believers and we're forced to bear one another's burdens, we're forced to rejoice with those that rejoice, we're fo forced to mourn and weep with those that mourn and with weep, we're, we're encouraged to show hospitality to one another and to love one another and to go the second mile with one another. It gets me out of my comfort zone and it forces me to get over myself and it forces me to go against the grain of my sin nature and the grain of this culture in which every single solitary thing in this culture promotes me first. One of the reasons we're so discouraged if we're not careful during this time of year is because we say it every year, amen? And we're just going to get together with family and love on one another and we're not going to get caught up in the rat race of Christmas and some of you right now are so tuckered out and worn out and just absolutely done, yes or no? We get caught up in this rat race, and we need the church, and we need moments like these to bring us back to center and bring us back to focus. And one of the good things about the Lord's Supper Watch is it is something that is built in for you and for me and for our church and for us as the household of faith to deal with ourselves, to deal with our relationships, and to remind us that we belong to the Lord, and yes, we belong to one another, and we're connected together. And it is not appropriate for us to say, no matter what the year is, no, no matter what the generation is, it is not appropriate for us as Bible believers, as blood-bought children of God to say, this is my life. I'll do what I want to do when I want to do it, as long as I want to do it. And it's none of your business because what I do should be of no concern to you. You bug out. You leave me alone. You mind your own business. That may sound good in our culture, but it is not Bible. Amen. Amen. We should run to one another. We should embrace accountability, and we should ask the Lord to help us. So today, with the Lord's help, I want us to single out a few principles concerning the Lord's Supper and why we partake of the Lord's Supper. And then when we partake of the Lord's Supper, man, could we put an exclamation mark on it and recognize in our heart what this is all about. Number one, what's the purpose of the Lord's Supper? The first principle is remembering. He said, this you do as often as you do it in remembrance of me. In verse 25, he says, in the same manner, he took the cup, and this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, you do it in remembrance of me. Verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Why do we partake of the Lord's Supper? Why are we participating today as a family in the Lord's Supper? Because it involves remembering. It is for you and for me to stop and to remember, and it forces me to think back. To think back to what? To the bread. What does the bread recognize and symbolize? The broken body of Jesus Christ. What does the cup symbolize? The blood of Jesus Christ. Who in the room can thank God today for the body that was broken and bruised and tattered and beaten that on the cross was broken for you and for me? Amen? I thank God for Christmas. My goodness gracious, I love Christmas. You know, every once in a while you run into those people that just want to always rain on your parade. There may be one or two of you in the room today. And if so, I've got just something to say to you. The rest of us are tired of it. Amen? If you want to know what we're laughing about, go look in the mirror. You'll see what all of us have been laughing about. We've had enough. Amen? And you talk to people and they say, well, Jesus wasn't born on December the 25th. Okay, fine. What's, what's the problem? Well, I believe you shouldn't celebrate Christmas. Well, you're just against everything. I bet your kids can't wait to get to your house. Amen? <laughs> Boy, you're a joy. A joy to be around the life of the party. Hallelujah. Let's go on over to their house. Yeah. Well, Jesus wasn't born on the 25th of December, preacher. Don't you know that? Well, I don't know what day he was born. Well, doesn't that bother you? It doesn't bother me at all. Why don't we celebrate him on December 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd? How about we celebrate on the 24th? What you say the 25th? I got an idea the day after the 26th. Why don't we keep it going all year long and all of next year? Yes or no? Could you just pick a day? Give me a day, any day. doesn't matter. I'll celebrate your day if you want to celebrate your day. Amen. I think any day we can give Jesus any praise, any glory, any credit, I think it's a good day to do it. And to all of the atheists, none of which are here today, who want a holiday, we're going to give you one. It's April 1st. Can I get a witness? That's a good day. Nobody claims that day. That's your day. Yes or no? There you go. You want it a day? You got it. April 1st. That's yours. Celebrate it. Enjoy it. 
But I want you to know, listen, as we gather during this Christmas season, we that know the Lord know he didn't stay just a little babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, but he dwelt among men and he knew no sin and he grew up and he died on an old rugged cross and shed his blood and was buried and arose again and he ascended to be at the right hand of the throne of God and one day he's coming again. Amen? And when we partake of the Lord's Supper, it involves remembering and it is good. Is it not good for us? as a church family, to say, stop all of this rush. Stop it. And let's remember. My family, when we sit down and eat, it's amazing what all we talk about. And we'll often remember stories and recollect stories and remember this or that or remember fun times or good times. And I think it's good for us as a church family to sit down and remember. All of our staff, with three exceptions, three that were not able to make it, and their families were at our home Friday for our Christmas party. And man, we just all gathered up, all of us, because we really love each other. And I promise you that. And uh, we ate, and we ate, and, and, and I had to preach a sermon on gluttony after watching some of them. <laughs> I won't name any names, amen. Of course, I didn't, but nonetheless... And then we played games, and we got some cheaters on our staff. You need to pray for them. They need deliverance. You need to pray for them, plead the blood on them. They need help, amen? And there's just something about sitting down at a table, yes or no, eating, laughing, sharing stories, remembering it's good. And it's good for us today as a church to pull up, watch a chair at the Lord's table and to recognize the only reason I'm there is because of the grace of God. I don't deserve a seat at that table. I don't deserve to be there with him or with you. And I remember and I recollect the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, and that's the only right that I have to be at that table. Secondly, not only does this teach us to remember, watch, the second principle we learn from the Lord's Supper is sharing. Now, when you go back and study 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 and put the context together, you will discover some interesting principles that Paul is trying to get across to this church. He says to them, for example, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread, one body. We all partake of that one bread. We being many, there's one bread, there's one body that we all partake. What is he saying? He's trying to say, watch, when we as a church participate in the Lord's Supper, it teaches me the principle of sharing, and it reminds me all of us are needy. Every single last one of us in the room are in need of the grace of God. I mean, that's why we sing so passionately, oh God, my God, I need you. I need you now. Why? Because we recognize our need for him. Amen? And there's something about us as a church family when we gather together, we're reminded of how needy we really are. None of us are righteous. All of us are in need of the grace of God. But listen to this, all of us are equally in need of the grace of God. All of us are recipients of a grace that's undeserved. There's no one in the room, no one, that it could be said of them, well, they deserve the grace of God. Paul writes to him and he says, look, you've got all kind of divisions among you. Chapter 11, verse 18, he says, you've got divisions, you're fighting, you're torn apart, you're arguing. Here's what you're doing. You're gathering around the Lord's table and yet you're not right with each other. You're fighting among yourselves. One of you thinks you're better than the other. And you're, and you're looking down your nose at others. And then you're formulating cliques and groups. And some are saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. And others say, we don't follow any man. We're just following Christ. And Paul is writing to them and he's saying, watch, when you partake of the Lord's Supper, hear me in a minute, in a moment when we all participate in the Lord's Supper, young, old, red, yellow, black, white, rich, poor, it should remind every single solitary one of us that all of us are needy. All of us are recipients of the grace of God. All of us need the grace of God. All of us equally need. I'm going to keep preaching until you get it. You, you need to hear me when I tell you every single last one of us equally need the grace of God. 
No one in this room needs the grace of God more, the grace of God less. No one in this room has earned their right, earned their passage, or deserves it. Every single one of us, every single one of us need it. And we come together to share that truth. Watch this, that we're the family of God, and we're just so thankful to be a part of the family. Amen? Amen. The third principle the Lord's Supper teaches us is worshiping. Now, back in chapter 10, verse 21 and 22, listen to what Paul says. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord in the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table under the table of demons. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he is? What is he saying? Watch this. There's no room to come to the Lord's table, and then you return to pagan gods. Hey, listen, I get it. 2023, whew. what I'm about to tell you <laughs> won't sell a lot of books. But I'm going to tell you the truth. Don't you come in here and put your dirty, polluted hands on the holy things of God. Don't you come into this church and make a mockery of the blood of Jesus Christ and the broken body of Christ by pledging your allegiance to him and drinking that cup and eating that bread and then going and cleaving, clinging to demons and pagan idols. You make up your mind today what side you're on and draw a line and get on one side or the other. And you quit halting and limping between two opinions. You maybe could teach math book living as a fornicator, but you can't teach the Bible that way. And you make a talk about Socrates and Plato. Are you listening? The debauchery and the wickedness that has come out of our nation's capital this week, and I want all of you Republicans to listen to me. Shame on any of us. Because we've got our own problems in this party of family values, the whole bunch needs to be called out. And I'm telling you right now, listen, the wickedness and the depravity on display in our nation's capital, the debauchery, the fornication, the homosexuality, the ungodliness, the depravity, God, clean us up. But I'm going to tell you, we got to get our church cleaned up. And we got to get cleaned up. We don't have any moral authority to speak to politicians when we live wicked lives. And I'm telling you, when we think about the blood of Jesus and we think about the broken body of Jesus, we are called out to live a holy life and to lay all of our idols and to turn away from all idols and to turn away from all, listen, paganism and wickedness and ungodliness. You say, preacher, that's legalism. That's old-fashioned. That's out of date. No, no, that's Bible. Have some standards. You say, are you afraid of God killing you? No, I'm afraid of hurting the heart of God. Amen? And at the end of the day, we don't go to heaven cleaning our life up. You're exactly right, but now that we're going to heaven, don't we want to live a clean life? And what he's saying is when you come to the Lord's table, you've got to lay aside all this paganism and lay aside all this idolatry. You're not going to come in one hand and worship the Lord around his table and in the other hand, worship at the table of demons. Make up your mind. And I'm just going, I'm going to have to be bold. Could I? Could I? Could I really? I mean, next Sunday's Christmas Eve. We've got to be sweet and nice. <laughs> Silent night. Amen? So today, we're going to let her rip tater chip. Amen? <laughs> turn from your fornication. Turn from your adultery. Turn from your paganism. Turn from your drunkenness. Turn from your idolatry. Turn from your wickedness. Repent. Return to the Lord with all of your heart. Don't come halfway. Come all the way. Come all the way. Come right away. Come right now. And I'm going to be as honest as I've ever been with you as a church. If you're not going to do it, don't you dare partake of the Lord's Supper today. At least have the integrity to be honest with God and honest with yourself. Amen? And he's saying, watch this, leave it all. Because when we come to his table, what we're saying is, Lord, I'm embracing you, and I'm turning, I'm turning it all loose. Woo. Well, Amen. The fourth principle that we learn from the Lord's Supper is it teaches about examining. Chapter 11, verse 28, let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Let a man examine himself. Now, this doesn't mean you examine your spouse. I got to have a pause so that can sink in. Amen? He, he's not saying examine your kids, examine your parents. He's saying, let a man examine himself, which means I've got to deal with my sin. 
When I participate in the Lord's Supper, when I partake of the Lord's Supper, I am admonished in Scripture by the Apostle Paul to examine myself. Now, very quickly before we move on, what was going on in this church? Well, if you know anything about the Corinthian church, they were arguing about every single thing that you could possibly argue about. Let's just take a little trip very quickly and talk about it. They were taking each other to court. They were arguing over marriage. They were arguing over drunkenness. They were arguing over the offering. They were arguing over the Lord's table. They were arguing over baptism. They were arguing over spiritual gifts. And they were getting puffed up, and they were saying, I've got a spiritual gift that you don't have, and therefore I'm more spiritual than you. I'm better than you are. There was pride. There was arrogance. There was ego. There was ego. They were formulating groups, cliques. They thought they were better. They were looking down their nose. And what Paul was really trying to say is this. What Paul was trying to get them to understand was this principle. You don't even know each other. You don't even know that right under your nose there is a widow who is broken, who is hurting, who is grieving. And the reason you don't know it is because you're so absorbed in yourself, you have no time for anyone else. You don't even know that there's someone else in your church that's crying themselves to sleep at night with a broken heart, with a hurting heart. And the reason is simply put, you're so absorbed in yourself, you don't even know it. And that's exactly what Paul was telling them. Paul was telling them, you've got to get over yourself. And you've got to understand that the key to victorious Christian living is to live for others. And to put others before yourself and the needs of others before your own needs. And to minister to them and to care for them. And it means to know their names and know who they are. And know their burdens and know their heartaches. I receive dozens of messages every week from you in this church asking me to pray for you. And there is no higher calling. I'm thankful for the privilege to preach. But what an honor to get to pray for you by name. And to pray for your needs and to pray for your burdens and your hurts. Wayward children, hurting marriage, sick family members, Death of loved ones. Miss Claudette, our preschool minister, lost her dad this morning who went to be with the Lord. And there's just always needs. Yes or no? There's not a 24-hour period that goes by in our church where there's not real needs. And what a joy. I mean, it really is. Does it sometimes get tiring for us? Yes. But what a real joy, is it not? And Paul said, what you've got to do is you've got to come and you've got to examine yourself you got to deal with your sin. And the first sin you got to deal with is the fact that there's disunity. You're fighting among yourself. And you're never going to be able to go anywhere divided. you got to get this straight, church. You're arguing over everything. You're so spiritually immature. Somehow, church, I would say to us today, if we try to apply this, that we in this room have to learn there's essentials and non-essentials. And problems happen when we elevate non-essentials to the role of essentials. Let me give you a couple of essentials. The virgin birth. We're not changing on that. We're not, that's not up for vote. Amen. Well, preacher, do you know they're going to laugh at us out there if we tell them that we believe in the virgin birth? Let them laugh. He had to come as he came to be what he was. He had to be what he was to do what he did. He had to do what he did so I can have what he has. I've got to have what he has if I'm going to go where he is. He had to be born of a virgin. Are you listening? That's not up for discussion. Argue, say you don't believe it. Roll your eyes all you want to. No virgin birth, no Christmas story. Amen. There's a virtuous life. He lived a perfect life. He knew no sin. He never committed a sin. Never an evil act, never an evil thought, never an evil deed. Amen. Mm. The vicarious death, which means he took my place. He died on a cross. He laid down his life on a cross for me. The victorious resurrection. Hallelujah, he's alive. The visible ascension. He went back to be at the right hand of the throne of God. These are not up for debate. We don't vote on these as a church. We don't sit around and argue and debate. This is what makes Christianity Christianity. This is the hinge upon which the door swings. Now, there are other issues that are not nearly as important. We can discuss them. We can talk about them. But we're not going to go to seed over them. And we're not going to lose ourselves over them. Because what brings us together is the essentials of the faith. And we've got to examine ourselves. Lord, don't allow us to be so consumed that we miss others. Let me give you the fifth. Who's still awake? Say amen. Amen. We're almost done. 
And if you're our guest, that doesn't mean a thing in the world. We just say that every once in a while to encourage. We throw that out there. I mean, it gives you a little hope. Amen? (laughs) The fifth principle the Lord's Supper teaches me is it's about proclaiming. He says, verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim. That word means you herald, you announce the Lord's death till he comes. Guess what that means? In just a moment, you are about to preach a sermon. You're about to say to your wife, to your husband, to your son, to your daughter, to your family, to your friends, to those that are in this room, you are about to say, I am heralding and announcing and proclaiming and showing the Lord's death till he come. I believe in the broken body. I believe in the shed blood. And my life is all about him. That's an interesting message. Amen? Amen? They say, practice what you preach. No, 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 no. Only preach what you practice. The sixth and final principle of what we learn at the Lord's table is this. It teaches me anticipation. Now, in verse 26, he says, as often as you drink this be- uh, eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. You herald, you announce, you show the Lord's death. Well, you say, preacher, Jesus only died once. So why then are we participating in the Lord's Supper more than once? Good question, really good question. And here's the answer. It's found in that verse. As often, he doesn't tell us how often to do it. He says, as often as you do it. You know, some churches, they do it every week. They do it every time they gather. Some churches do it once a year. I think if you're not careful, you can do it so often that it loses its significance. But what he does say is, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, here's what you do. You proclaim the Lord's death. Notice the last line, till he comes. In other words, the reason we participate in the Lord's Supper more than once is because every time, whoo, my goodness gracious, man, mm, this is better than Christmas morning. You listening to me, amen? Amen? Mama, is the preacher about to have a fit? Just hang on now, all right? Listen, one of the most exciting reasons we participate in the Lord's Supper is because of what we just got through singing. It is a reminder that we show the Lord's death yet, but till he comes. And what that means is we as a church say, Maranatha, even so come Lord Jesus. And the family truth that holds us together is that we believe in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, not everyone in this room believes it the way I believe it, which is why I always preach it. (laughs) Amen? But what we all believe is that he's coming. Amen? We may differ over the when, the how, all that stuff, but he's coming. And I'm just telling you right now, the coming of the Lord draws nigh. And Jesus is coming again. And when I reflect on the broken body and the shed blood, and I'm reminded as a family that we're in a family, I'm reminded that one day soon, he's coming. You say, preacher, the church is going under. You better watch your mouth. Jesus said, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. In other words, there is no demon. Dr. Fauci can't shut it down. The government can't shut it down. The Republicans, the Democrats, your political candidate, the mayor. Can I get a witness from anyone in the room? The governor, all the demons of hell cannot stand against the church. It's his church. It's not your church. It's not my church. It's his church. And he said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail, will not overshadow, will not overthrow it. There is no demon on this earth that can stop his church. His church will prevail. I'm glad to know you can be on the winning side. Amen? Amen. My goodness gracious. I've told this story before, but I've got to tell it again. I think it was 2007. I was in um, Gallatin, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville, and I was preaching a weekend revival. And on that Saturday, LSU and Auburn were playing football, and why I ever committed to go preach on a Saturday during a football game, I'll never understand, but I did it. That's a joke. Y'all are supposed to laugh. Amen. (laughs) So I preached on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and the pastor was an LSU fan as well. So he told me when I preached on Friday, he said, now tomorrow I'm going to record the game. Uh, You preach, and we're going to go home. We're going to have food, and we'll start the game, and we'll fast forward through commercials, and we'll try to catch up. I said, that sounds like a plan. 
So I, I preached, shortest message I've ever preached. But anyway, I preached, <laughs> gave the invitation, and uh, got in his truck. We went to his house. We started the game, and, and wouldn't you know it, Julie would call me. And she'd say, uh, you watching the game? I said, Julie, I'm in the first quarter. You need to hush. Leave me alone. Don't tell me. Isn't, there's always one in the crowd, yes or no, that'll <laughs> rain on it for you. And so the first half did not go for us. My goodness, it was horrible. And I think our quarterback threw two pick sixes, and we were behind. And, man, about the third quarter, we were convinced it's, you know. And, and she kept calling me. Where are you? We're in the third quarter. Well, I'm in the fourth quarter. Well, Julie just, she goes, keep watching, keep watching, keep watching. And so then she called me, and um, she said, where are you? And I told her where we were in the game, and I think at that point we were down by 10 points. And she said, well, all I'm going to say is it gets good. And then she hangs up. <laughs> and still for about 10 minutes, I'm sitting there, we're biting our fingernails, and we're just like, I mean, this is. And, of course, if you remember anything about that year, that was one of our national championships. Just in case you have forgotten, I'd like to remind you, but... <laughs> But, um, you know, we would have not had a chance for the national championship if we lost that game. And so we get in the fourth quarter. We're still down. We're still on pins and needles. And all of a sudden, I remember the words of Julie, it's about to get good. And I just kick back and relax. And the preacher looks over at me, and he goes, you okay? I said, I've never been better. And he goes, well, what's wrong? I said, nothing. It's about to get good. You know, I had heard from someone who already witnessed the end of the game. And they told me, you're worrying for absolutely no purpose. It's about to get good. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, we go through this world and we get down, yes or no. We hear all kind of garbage and foolishness and we get depressed, discouraged. But we read the end of the book. And I've got some news for you. You ready? You ready? I haven't been to the end, but I have read from and heard from the one who already knows the end from the beginning. And he says, it's about to get good. <laughs> Amen? So when you partake of the Lord's Supper, yes, you examine yourself. Yes, you want to live a holy life. But once you know you've confessed your sin, you ought to shout like a Pentecostal over the reality that soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Amen? Amen? As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes.